hello and welcome back. Today I want to start talking about photovoltaic cells or solar panels. I want to look at how these things work and how they can be modeled using LTSPICE. Since there's quite a bit to discuss, today I will mostly look at the generic model and its components, what are the general behaviors that need to be modeled, and next time I will look at more complicated algorithms to determine all of the cell's parameters and how these can be implemented in the simulation program. So if you're curious about that and much more, then keep watching. So before looking at how the simulation model can be created, we need to look at what a solar panel is. Well, it's a panel. It's a large flat structure built with multiple individual solar cells or solar cell modules, and these can be arranged either in series or in parallel, or both, depending on the voltage that you want to get out of the panel. And the main useful property of the solar panel is that it converts light energy into electrical energy. Now, of course, depending on the technology of manufacturing, the materials used, environmental parameters like temperature and light density, but also the exact load to which the panel is connected to, more or less of the solar energy will be converted to electrical energy. So the efficiency that you will be getting from your solar panel is not a constant. So it's important to understand how the various parameters affect the solar cell's output to get the highest possible yield from it. Now, the main use case for a simulation model is to verify what sort of power output you should be getting under a specific set of conditions. But you may also be interested to verify that the circuitry after the panel can maximize the conversion rate. Or in other words, to make sure that the panel is used as close as possible to its maximum power point under all conditions. So first things first, what is a solar cell? Well, basically, it's just a very big diode. Usually it's built with multiple junctions in series, so you will rarely find it as a single junction cell. But the fundamental behavior behind it is that when you expose this link junction to light, a certain voltage will be produced. We can of course verify this effect using a semiconductor diode inside of a glass package connected to a millivolt meter. So as it stands, it's not doing much, so we have the 200 millivolt scale, but if I expose it to a relatively strong amount of light, we do get a certain voltage developing. So without light, there's nothing. With light, we have about 12, 13 millivolts. Now, the voltage that you're getting is quite minute. It's not going to be able to power anything. But this effect is enhanced in components like photodiodes. And it's even more enhanced in a solar panel, where the junction area of the panel is spread out over the entire surface of the solar cell, thus greatly improving the visible light to electric energy conversion phenomenon. And similarly, we can verify that the solar cell is a diode. So what I have here is a small solar cell module connected in parallel to a voltmeter and in series with a resistor through which we will be connecting it to a power supply. So as it stands, it's producing a small voltage, but if I place it face down so that no light can access it, we don't get any more voltage. Now, if we connect the cell to the power supply, and we start raising the voltage, we can see that both the power supply and the cell voltage are increasing. But at some point, the voltage on the cell falls behind the voltage on the power supply. So we have about 4.3 volts coming from the power supply, only 1.8 on the cell. If we increase the voltage even more, the voltage on the cell starts to stabilize. Now, if we reverse the power supply voltage, so we have the exact same circuit, but supplied in reverse, we see a far greater voltage drop on the cell. It's not exactly the same voltage as on the power supply. There still is some sort of leakage current going through the cell, but we don't see the voltage conducting mechanism that we saw when we were driving the cell directly. So the photovoltaic cell cannot just provide the voltage and current when exposed to light. It can become a load when there is no light if a voltage coming from somewhere else has the right polarity. Now, the main difference between a generic diode and the solar panel is that the junction area in the panel is huge. The larger the junction that you expose to light, 
the more light energy can be converted. So this is a good thing for the solar cell. But normally this is a feature that you do not want in a diode. Since large surface area in the junction means large junction capacitance. This will have a detrimental effect on the switching properties of the diode, which is something you definitely don't want, but in a solar cell you don't really care since you're not using the cell in a fashion where current through it ends up switching. So in most cases, even though the junction in the solar cell has quite a bit of capacitance, it ends up being neglected because it's just not a relevant property. Another important property of diodes, which is also an important property of solar panels, is temperature dependence. So with a diode, the higher the temperature means the lower the forward voltage is. Increasing temperature therefore is a useful thing to reduce power dissipation. But with a solar cell, it's not really that helpful since in a similar fashion, temperature will impact the solar cell's output voltage. Now if we have a look at the information contained in a typical solar panel datasheet, so I've found this randomly on the internet, so other than the voltage and current information under standard testing conditions, so 1000 watts per square meter, 25 degrees Celsius, we also sometimes get information about how the voltage and current output varies with temperature. So here we have this nice temperature characteristics table, and this tells us that we have an open circuit voltage temperature coefficient of negative 0.28% per degree Celsius, and what this means is that the higher you go up in temperature, the lower the output voltage will be, and you also get a temperature coefficient of the short circuit current, which is a positive 0.04% per degree Celsius. So the hotter this solar panel is, the higher the current. Now you can already see that the voltage temperature coefficient is far larger than the current temperature coefficient, and if you don't have the output power temperature coefficient, you can work it out from these two, but in this case we already have it. So we can see that the maximum output power has a negative temperature coefficient, meaning that the hotter the solar cell is, the smaller the output power. Or in other words, it's best to keep your solar panel as cold as possible to get the highest possible yield out of it. Therefore, fundamentally the problem of simulating a solar cell is the problem of simulating a diode. So the typical solar cell model looks something like this. At the center we have a single diode, or you can have multiple ones if you want more accuracy. Then you have some series resistance, so this represents the various series elements, interconnections between multiple junctions or wiring, and then you also have a parallel or shunt resistance, so this accounts for various internal losses or leakages. And finally, the photovoltaic part of the photovoltaic cell is represented by a current source. So depending on the light intensity to which the panel is exposed to, more or less current will be generated by this current source. Now the way in which this model works is that when you have no load at the output, all of the current generated by the current source closes through the internal diode and the internal shunt resistance. So the voltage drops on these two elements at the specific current will dictate the open circuit voltage of the solar cell. And when you add a load to the output, the output voltage will drop, so you will no longer have sufficient voltage to forward bias the internal diode. So the current will start to flow through the outer circuit. So the maximum power point of a solar cell, the point where most power gets delivered to the output, is occurring right at this transition point where current stops flowing through the internal diode and most of it starts going through the external load resistance. Now when you're modeling a large panel or an array of panels, you can model every single junction or every single panel with its own respective model, and this is most useful when you're trying to see what happens when your solar panels are receiving different amounts of light. So since the current passing through one of these elements is related to the amount of light, it doesn't matter what the other one is doing because the current that it produces will be limited by the panel with the least amount of light illumination. So especially with large arrays, this posed at different angles towards the sun, this can be quite a big issue. Now on the other hand, if you're simulating a single small panel where you can make the assumption that all of it receives a uniform amount of light, you can simply use the simple four component model. 
And this will give quite a good result at modeling small panels, and it will be much simpler to implement and to utilize. So what I prepared here is a setup with this module that has about three cells in series, and these are placed vertically, connected it to a fixed value resistor and to a voltmeter. Now, if I use a light blocking material and cover about 30% of the cell's surface, maybe 40%, but uniformly over all of the junctions, we see quite a small variation in the output voltage. So we go from the 1.7 down to about 1.6. So not that big of a difference. But now if I take the same exact surface area, but rather than covering all of the individual cells, I cover only a single cell, we see a far more dramatic effect. So we go down from 1.7 to 1.1. And depending on where exactly I'm covering the cell, I can get an even larger effect. So this shows that non-uniform exposure to light of multiple cells in series will not produce the same effect as having the same total amount of light evenly distributed over all of the cells. The total power output of the cell array will be dependent on the light that each of the cells individually gets. You can just average everything out. Now, from a simulation point of view, the one diode two resistor model is also called a five parameter model because it has up to six parameters defining it. So the parameters needed to define this model are the values of the resistors, the current generated by the current source, and then the diode is defined by two to three parameters. So starting off with the diode, the parameters are needed in the Shockley diode equation. So you got your IO dark saturation current or just saturation current, you'll find it under multiple names. A is an ideality factor. How close is the response of this diode to an ideal diode? And then your sixth parameter is this N, which can represent the number of junctions in series in your modeled cell. So if you're modeling a single junction, then this parameter can disappear, hence the five parameters. But if you want to model multiple junctions in series, then you can add this extra parameter. Now, coming to the current generated by the current source, this represents the current conversion from light energy. So this current is dependent on the light intensity to which the panel is exposed to. So sometimes you'll find this as a voltage dependent current source where the voltage is the light intensity. And again, it's important to remember that this current isn't really a constant. I mean, it's not just dependent on the light intensity, it's also dependent on temperature. So higher temperatures will yield higher currents. Finally, we have the two resistors, which again are not constants. Now the series resistance has quite small variation with temperature and light intensity, but it still can vary. But your parallel resistance does have far greater variation with the intensity of the light. So the big problem with modeling solar panels or solar cells comes from the fact that the parameters defining the model are not constants. All of these parameters depend to a larger or smaller extent on the temperature at which the panel is being simulated and the light intensity to which it is exposed to. So a good simulation model needs to use not just these parameters, but also the temperature and light intensity inputs. Even though the solar cell behaves like a diode, with all the complex behaviors associated with that, the main thing you would be usually interested in obtaining from a simulation model is what is the output voltage and current for a specific load under a specific set of environmental parameters. The rest of the behaviors are usually ignored. There are a lot of research papers out there that discuss the topic of modeling solar cells, and most of them agree on the basic model the two resistor one diode model being the most widely used since it offers decent accuracy while still being relatively simple to implement. Having just five parameters is an apparently simple problem to solve. It just becomes really complicated when you want to keep all of these parameters temperature and light intensity dependent. Now there are different algorithms out there to determine the set of parameters and you could implement your algorithm of choice in a spreadsheet program or some mathematics software. But what if you could put the algorithm directly into LTSpice? We should try that next time. But for now, 
Hope you guys missed some information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.